All right. So welcome everybody to our To My Eye lecture. Today, it's a, it's a real pleasure to have Leonidas Gebers with us. Leo is a professor at Stanford University where he is leading the geometric computation group. Um, I think it's probably hard to make an appropriate introduction for Leo. I think everybody in both graphics, machine learning and computer vision communities, they all know Leo. He's, he's an icon in geometric processing and he has shaped the research area for, for decades now, I think, um, starting with traditional approaches and recently, of course, with a lot of a lot of work in uh, geometric deep learning, where he and his team was one of the pioneers with data sets from ShapeNet to PointNet, all from his group. And I think it's probably fair to say the state of the art without his efforts would never be the same that it is right now today. So I feel very, very fortunate um, having, you know, known Leo now for quite a while and worked with him. I think it's rare to find anybody at his seniority to be so passionate about, about the research and um, I'm very, very happy to have him here today. Okay, uh, well, Matthias, uh, thank you very much for the, first for the invitation to this lecture series and also for this kind introduction. Um, today, I'll talk about a topic I call joint learning and it'll be over visual and geometric data discussing some work in, in my group over the past few years. Let me make a, a quick introduction and motivation for this area. Um, of course, we all know that the success of deep learning today is to a very large extent due to having large annotated data sets and also lots of computing power. Think, you know, like ImageNet made a huge difference in progress in image understanding. On the other hand, in many settings, obtaining quality annotations from humans can be slow and demanding. And humans can be very good at giving you the semantic class of an object, telling you that's a car. Maybe not so bad to give you a 2D bounding box of the car. But if you start asking for more geometric information about what you see, for example, a 3D bounding box, that becomes more difficult and error prone to obtain. So there has been a lot of uh, effort in uh, trying to have learning protocols and architectures that reduce or minimize the amount of supervision that is needed. And it comes under many different names, uh, transfer learning, semi-supervised learning, few shot learning and supervised learning. And in this sea of names, I'm going to introduce one more, what I call joint learning, that looks more at the, what I would call the social aspects of learning, that uh, in learning data, training or testing have correlations, learning tasks have correlations, and even representations of data have correlations. And the basic notion is very simple. We can do better if we solve problems jointly than if we solve them in isolation. So the notion of joint learning is that we need to aggregate information in multiple ways over different data sets, over different modalities such as geometry, appearance, language, and so on, over space and time, over different representations, over different predictions, over different tasks. And, and if we do that in settings where all of these things talk about the same piece of the world and therefore they are correlated, then we can do better. And of course, the challenge in doing this is that uh, we need to get all these different uh, learning pieces to talk to each other. Aggregation is the ability to, to transport information to the same place and also to put it in a common format to have a representation consistency so that the aggregation can happen. And so in this presentation, I'll discuss a couple of tools that help in that, such as voting mechanisms, factorization and chemicalization, and also using path invariance and loop closure in transport networks. So briefly, an outline of my talk is to, is to start with some very basic background or 3D object-centric machine learning, and then focus on a, on a few vignettes that illustrate the joint learning idea in multimodal 3D object detection, SO3 equivariant networks, category level object pose estimation, spatiotemporal representations, and consistency among learning tasks. And so this covers joint learning in many settings over data sets, over representations, over multimodal data, and over learning tasks. 
I'll start with some background and I'll be very quick because I think to this group, this is bringing course to Newcastle. Everybody knows that. Uh, my group has focused on object centering machine learning, meaning it is helpfully in understanding you know, complex things in the world to decompose them into objects because objects are entities that have certain permanence, they maintain their appearance, their properties and so on as they get moved around. So they give us a, use of, a useful factorization of the world. And so Matthias mentioned already the shape that effort we started some years back together with collaborators at Princeton and at UT Austin. This is a set of about 3 million 3D models, mostly scraped from the web. But what shape that provides is semantic annotations, both in terms of language for the object and its part, but also kind of geometry that, that is part of the compositions, symmetries, uh, you know, correspondences and so on, and a bit of materials and affordances and, and so on. In fact, the affordance part, I think, is a very interesting part to understand how humans interact with objects. It's often is through the, mid, through the medium of shape parts. So we've been interested in decomposing shapes into parts for a long time. Uh, for example, the most recent effort in that, in that respect is PartNet where we try to have very fine part annotations. As I show here in this keyboard, every key is a separate part. And the reason fine parts are interesting is because humans often interact with objects by their hands. Hands are small and they typically press buttons, turn levers, grasp a small kind of cylinder-like areas. So understanding this structure can be critical to understanding uh, how, how uh, objects function. And in particular, objects have art articulations that really matter for their functionality. So that's one piece of background I wanted to, to briefly cover. The other is a very quick review of, uh, of deep learning on, on point clouds. Uh, we started some years back on trying to duplicate in the point cloud domain what had been done so well in the image domain in terms of object classification, segmentation, and so on. The challenge is that in, in point clouds, uh, the structure of the data is irregular. Each point has a neighborhood that is uh, different, possibly. It's not like a regular grid, like in the image domain. So a lot of the convolutional architectures that uh, depend on this regularity for weight sharing and other optimizations cannot be applied. Also, there's certain invariances that the model has to maintain because, again, the point cloud is a set of points. The ordering doesn't matter, so it has to be independent of the ordering, what we compute. It has to be invariant with special transforms. And, and something even more challenging is to get sampling invariance because what we're really interested in is the underlying object, not the particular set of samples that we have from it. So we have at the different samplings, how can we guarantee that we get the same result? The basic point that architecture was to take our 3D points, have a learned map that lifts them to a high dimensional space, a high dimensional feature space, and then aggregate them by a symmetric operator. This guarantees that the order of the points doesn't matter and do some further processing to complete the task. <clears throat> Notice that in many geometry problems we are dealing we set the nuisance factors. For example, the points are given to us in some particular coordinate system. We could have chosen a different coordinate system. Nothing would have changed in terms of the semantics, but of course, all the coordinates of the points would be different. So issues of, of invariance and equivariance that it will come back to in a little bit really matter. The basic point in that architecture was uh, essentially this, this lifting map from three dimensions to a thousand dimensions by a couple of MLP stages interspersed with a couple of transform nets that try to do a rotation basically in that space to canonicalize how the network sees the point and therefore points and therefore make the task of the network easier. Once the points have been lifted into this fixed space, they're aggregated by a, by a max pooling operation in point net. This gives a global fixture that then can be passed to another MLP to give us a per, per class output scores. Or we can take one of these intermediate representations that are per point, append the global feature, pass this through another shared MLP for each point and get sort of your per point classification scores as we might need for say segmentation. 
<clears throat> again, notice that in the basic point net, the points don't talk to each other at all until this very last aggregation step. So this gave us uh, some surprisingly good, uh, good results at the time, like this kind of segmentation of point clouds. But of course, not knowing your neighborhood is a, is a serious issue. So we uh, extended point net to point net plus plus, which is a hierarchical version of point net. Uh, essentially, you show here a 2D example, you have your point cloud, you, you take certain point neighborhoods and apply a point net locally to each neighborhood. So now you can get essentially a feature for each of these uh, center points. These are now points that have X, Y, Z coordinates, but also a high dimensional feature. And then you essentially aggregate them hierarchically like this, applying many small point nets over these setup structure stages to aggregate information. And then you can again do a classification stage or upsample back to the point to get a, a per point classification. One of the challenges of point net, especially point net plus plus, is that you have to deal with varying density in the point clouds, and that's especially challenging in point net plus plus, because at the lower levels of the, of the hierarchy that you build, you may have very few points. And so there's a real danger that what the network learns is the sampling pattern and not the underlying geometry. Okay, that was my uh, supersonic uh, review. And let me go to my first vignette. I'll talk about uh, voting schemes for op object detection. This uh, is joint learning by linking those who have information to exchange. And it does the linking by physically moving them close to each other. The problem here is a very classic one. I give you a point cloud of an environment that is indoor scene, should be very familiar to all of you. Uh, and I want to do object detection. So I want to find, say, uh, your bounding boxes and uh, semantic labels. And uh, we approach this uh, by, a, a, by a, a voting scheme, uh, which really is an implementation of a very classic computer vision idea, the generalized half transform, but now done in a fit forward and fully differentiable way. And uh, here, is the, oops, here is the pipeline. You, you have the scene point cloud, you subsample it, these are the blue points obtained by, by fullness point sampling. And now comes the first idea. Each of these so-called seed points votes for a red point. And it tries to essentially predict where is the center of the uh, shape of the object that is part of. So hopefully you've done this right. You will see some clustering of the, uh, of the red points in this, in this vote space. These are not points that are part of the original point cloud. These are points in space that the network hallucinates. And then you process this point cloud now, the red points, to cluster the votes and obtain uh, bounding boxes for the objects through, I mean, through various steps that we'll not discuss in detail, uh, you know, and on maximal suppression and so on. So the way this is done technically is by having two point nets back to back. Mm -hmm. So the first point net takes in the uh, endpoints we started from, uh, and then uh, for each of the M seed points computes, uh, uh, um, I mean, it co co computes a feature and generates a vote and a feature for the vote. The multi-scale structure of point net is critical here because for a point to know where the center of its object is, the neighborhood size that you look around the point really matters. If you take the neighborhood too small, you may not be able to tell. I mean, near this tabletop, small neighborhoods all look the same. At the same time, if you take the neighborhoods so too large, then you start including other objects into the neighborhood, and it makes it difficult to know where to go. So this first point net uh, essentially creates these red points, and now this is a second point net that processes these red points, which are sort of fictitious points, points that we generate, to, to cluster essentially these points and generate uh, the, you know, the object proposals and then filter them through some non-maximal suppression and so on. 
the point is here that in this stage, we want points that belong to the same object to talk to each other. In a standard point net, that's not so easy because you may have a long couch where the two ends of it are very far away. These points will not talk to each other except at the very top, very far away. And so essentially what this is, this is like a small capsule network really that implements the communication that you need between the capsules by physically moving the points so that the second stage point net has them cross to each other. So all the points that think they are part of this table will talk to each other because they have voted for places that are near each other in space so they can aggregate their feature information and produce a good proposal. That is the key idea of this. Uh, and this is the voting idea. And it's, an, and it's a small example of joint learning because all these different opinions about where the center of the table should be come together to collaborate and, and do the estimation. Uh, here's an example output. Uh, the images are not part of the input to the network. They are there for you to understand the scene. Um, here are the vote net predictions and here is the ground truth. Notice that vote net even found one of the shares that was not annotated in the ground truth. And of course, since this is too, nothing would uh, be accepted without showing some results on ScanNet. Uh, so here are some more complex uh, scenes where in fact there are lots of objects are very close to each other that, that you can see. I will not show so many tables with numbers in this talk. I just want to show this one because what was surprising to us is that VoteNet working with geometry only uh, was doing better than techniques that use both geometry and appearance. And of course, this is counterintuitive. That shouldn't be. The more, uh, the more information you have, the better you should be able to do. But it shows how subtle it is to do joint learning when you have different modalities, when you try to combine image or appearance information and point cloud information. Um, I mean, of course, you could say you take your points and you have X, Y, Z, and then you also add RGB, so now you have 60 points. But this does not work that well. So we found that uh, the best way to combine the best attributes of images that give us higher resolution than coverage, uh, but of course are subject to many imaging artifacts with point clouds that give us absolute depth and scale, but are sparse and low res, is to actually do also voting in 2D space to do image votes. And uh, so, you know, not combine at the, uh, at the pixel level, I mean, at the point level, but combine at the vote level. Uh, and this is useful if you have situations where your maybe 3D data is very sparse, so you are just getting some, some slump key points because you don't have a real depth sensor. And then the image information can become quite important. So in this follow-on work, the image vote net, there are essentially two different pipelines, one that does voting via 2D, via images, and one that does voting via 3D, and then they get combined at the vote level. I will not go into detail here. Um, and you can see that uh, this helps, uh, for example, um, dark black sofas like this don't are not very visible in the point cloud and uh, VoteNet misses them. But then when you add the, when you add the image a supervision, this really helps. I want to briefly mention a couple of follow-on works to this. Uh, this was in ICCB 2019. There was this follow-on work from Xi Huang, who was a student in my group uh, in a postdoc uh, before. Uh, this is the notion that why vote just for the center of the bounding box? You could also imagine voting for the uh, faces, for the centers of the faces or the centers of the edges. And then, well, and then once you have this independent vote, you can combine them in, in an optimization stage in the end. And this helps because depending on how you see the object, some of these representations can be easier to regress than others. For example, for this kind of table here, I mean, the center of the, uh, of, of the bounding box of the table is, is a point in free space somewhere there. 
it's not so easy to, for the network to regress that, but it's much easier to regress the center of the tabletop or the centers of the legs. And that's the idea. Another extension that I want to briefly mention is this work that will appear at the CDPR, where we try to, to reduce the amount of supervision needed for, uh, for botnet. <coughs> Uh, by having some label data, but then also lots of unlabeled data. And uh, this is based on a, well, a familiar student uh, teacher architecture where the teacher uses an exponentially weighted average of the student weights. The student, the teacher only gets a weak supervision through subsampling, the uh, student gets strong supervision through subsampling and geometric transformations. And then, of course, the, the idea is that essentially the teacher predictions get used to supervise the student. And the question is, how do you trust the, uh, the, uh, the teacher predictions? And there's various ways to do that based on object scores and class confidence scores. But we added one more that made a big difference based on estimating the OEU score for the prediction. I will not uh, discuss the details of that, but uh, it makes a big difference. Uh, here is, for example, Scarnet, and with uh, the supervision, we can get about you know 48 at MAP at at zero to pi, 0.25. If you remember the earlier slide, when you have all the data, you get something like 58.9 percent. So this is not so bad, having given only 10 percent of the data. Okay, uh, this was my first vignette. Uh, let me now go back to something more basic, uh, uh, because as, as I was saying, the coordinates that we have to process are kind of nuisance in the sense that they are not absolute, they depend on the coordinate system. And, and then depending on the application, you may want something that's invariant or something that's equivariant, say for classification, you know, the orientation shouldn't matter. If you are doing segmentation, of course, if, if you rotate the aeroplane, you want to rotate to rotate the segmentation, and similarly, perhaps, for a construction. But the challenge here is how to uh, pass a rotation through a latent formulation. I mean, you have a latent vector in some high dimensional Euclidean space. What should the rotation in 3D mean for that? And how to deal with nonlinearities, pooling, normalizations, and so on. Of course, this is a, yeah, a very important topic, and there's been a lot of work on it some based on invariant fixtures, some specific to uh, particular network architectures, and some that requires uh, integral mathematics, such as spherical harmonics in high dimensional spaces and linear matrices. So I'm going to propose a simpler approach to this, which is, OK, um, the latent space Instead of it being a vector of scalars in some high dimensional Euclidean space, think of it as a vector of three vectors, a three by K matrix. So your source input is a bunch of points in 3D, and your latent space is also a bunch of points in 3D. Ordered, of course, this is a matrix, it's an ordered set. If you have this kind of latent space, a rotation that you apply to the source can also be applied at the latent vector. So if we can do that, then we eliminate the prior that all shapes must be aligned, which is often how shape net models get used. Of course, we can process shapes from the wild that don't come with canonical poses, and we avoid ex exhaustive data augmentation. So let me briefly explain the notion of using neurons that operate on vectors. So classical neurons operate on scalars by computing linear combinations and on linearities, and now we will have neurons that operate on vectors. And if you have, of course, a set of uh, I mean, points, then this extends by one dimension. So the, so the classic thing becomes a matrix, and in our case, becomes a, a tensor. Uh, and so let me walk you through the different stages of the network and how you can pass rotations through them in, in, 
in this formulation. Uh, the most obvious one is the linear component. This is very straightforward. Essentially, you are multiplying your, your vector list by a, by, a, by a matrix that will transform from C channels to C prime channels. This is just a, a matrix, matrix multiplication, basically. And if you act on the coordinates of your vectors by a rotation, because you can associate this product either this way or, or the other way, this, this passes right through. Or, or if you want to see this in a picture, you know, I am multiplying the weights by the feature. If I act on the feature by rotation matrix, that passes through to acting on this by the same matrix because of associativity. What's more interesting is how to do vector nonlinearities. Uh, this requires that we actually learn a second uh, vector or direction. And then what happens is um, we, we, we clip the feature Q according to this second vector. So if the feature Q is in the positive half space of this directional vector K, then we leave it alone. But if it's in the negative half space, then we clip it we project it to the boundary of the half space. And this is this, this calculation here. And I think it's even kind of visually pretty obvious that if you rotate everything, the clipping just rotates the same way. And this is the, uh, the vector no, nonlinearity, uh, as I show here again. Um, one can do similar things for pooling. I mean, of course, mean pooling works fine because uh, it is all, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you are passing some linear combinations, so that, of course, is no problem. Max pooling is interesting, but you can approach it the same way. Namely, you, you can learn certain directions, and then you max pool along those directions, the same way that we learn the direction to do the, uh, the real U analog, the clipping. Um, normalizations, okay, well, certain things just, uh, just extend naturally, layer norm, instance norm, dropouts. The one that takes some effort is batch norm because it doesn't really make sense to average across instances that come in, yeah, in different orientations. So in this case, what we do is we apply the batch normalization to the invariant component, namely to the norms of this vector list and then scale appropriately for that. In many of these computations, we need equivariant and invariant layers. If you have equivariant layers, one standard way to get invariant layers is to take uh, two, two, two equivariant things and multiply one by the transpose of the other. Because if you apply a rotation to the first, the same rotation on the second when you transpose will become the, the inverse rotation and the two cancel each other. And in this case, what we do is we take our, our points and, and invent a coordinate system that will be equivariant. Um, and uh, actually we take the points and append to them also the mean of all the points to give some global context. And so the, the invariant is the, the original points multiplied by the transpose of this coordinate frame that we compute. And this clearly is invariant because if you apply a rotation matrix to the points, this passes through this uh, vector neuron MLP and uh, appears here. And then when you transpose, it appears here and it cancels. But if you want to see this in pictures, what I'm saying is, if you start with some input, apply two vector neurons and get say, a C1 by three and a C2 by three, equivariant things. Now, if you multiply this by the transpose of that, you will get an output that is invariant. And so in this particular case, we, we essentially, so one VN just copies the input, the other VN gives us this, 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 this coordinate frame three by three, and we are multiplying this by the transpose of that. Actually, we are also adding the, uh, the global mean to give some, some global context. So this is the basic building 
block for the vector neuron. And one now can try to put that into various traditional 3D pipelines. For example, we can take you know, GGCNN, where you have edge convolutions and aggregations. And then basically, you simply do the vector neuron analog of those, as I show here. Uh, so here you have the vector neuron ReLU and the vector neuron uh, are your pooling operations. Or one can take uh, uh, your point net and uh, uh, again, use, uh, use a lifting function that is equivariant, it's a VNMLP and use a, a pooling that is also equivariant, a VN pool. And here are some some examples on say classification tasks. Here is the original point net and GCMN. These are the vector neural versions of that. And for comparison, here are some other networks that don't especially try to, to attain rotation so independence. And this is it is a sum that do. And here Z slash Z means I train with rotations around the Z axis and test with rotations around the Z axis. ZSO3 means I train with direction rotations around the Z axis and test with rotations, arbitrary rotations. And here I train with arbitrary and train with uh, test, train with arbitrary and test with arbitrary. And as you can see in this column, when you don't have training with arbitrary rotations, the original networks have very bad performance and uh, VN versions do quite well. And, uh, and in general also, even if you look at the SO3 over SO3 case, you can see that uh, putting the equivariance in the network is superior to, to doing data augmentation. Similar results for segmentation using vector neurons. Uh, we are something we are playing with right now is doing reconstruction by a by a by a you know, implicit sort of DSDF like, but not assuming that the shapes are aligned. And here we use a VN point net encoder, and for a decoder we take. Uh, the query point X, our fiction vector Z and the inner products, which are invariant, the norm of the X that's invariant. And then this, uh, as I discussed, this invariant construction on Z. And uh, I just, this is still going on. Here are some, some results uh, using OCNET and a VM version of OCNET. And, uh, you know, even when trained with rotated shapes, Ocnet has some difficulty reconstructing this, this SO3 over SO3 setting. Um, yeah. I mean, the one area where we are not as good as the aligned case is, is the II. When you train, when you have aligned, training data and aligned queries, then we have some, some issues and that's something that we have to try to understand and fix. Okay, this was my second vignette. Um, and uh, I'll now move on to discussing category level pose estimation for objects. Um, so here the notion is, for a second. Um, that you want to estimate the 3D pose of an object, even though you don't fully know its class. Oops. Um, sorry. I'm, I'm losing, I am, huh. I am missing a slide here. I don't know where it went. Um, okay, what I was trying to show in, in this next slide is that the problem of estimating the pose of an object in the world can be complicated because the world itself is complicated. Uh, uh, 
because somehow we have to understand how this object sits in the 3D world. And perhaps we can do this more simply if we first, this is very strange that the sun disappeared. If, if we first lift the object, not into the 3D world, I mean the near 3D world, but we went into one that is simpler and made of our own choice. You know, if you park your car in your garage every day the same way, and then if I show you the picture of, of this car, it's fairly easy to estimate where in that 3D canonical place the a particular pixel or, or part of the image might go. Um, and uh, so, the, so the notion here is, let us construct canonical spaces, 3D canonical spaces into which we will lift the, um, the, um, the objects that we have. And in fact, because many similar objects in the same class can be lifted the same way, we can actually uh, simplify up the problem and canonicalize not over a single instance, but over the whole class of objects at the same time. And here I show an example coming from cars. And in the shape net setting, we start having a lot of uh, objects that are already have been aligned. So we have good training data to do that. And so we can uh, do this for many different classes. We can have a canonical object, a, can a canonical space, a canonicalize this over uh, size, orientation, and translation. And uh, so this is the notion of NOx that we introduced a couple of years back in CVPR 2019. And so the notion is that from a given view of an object, an image of an object, you are regressing this NOx map, that is the coordinates of the pixels that you see in this canonical space. And this canonical space can be used for multiple instances from the same class. And then from that, you can do a readout in 3D of what you saw. So this gave us an approach to do a 9D object pose and size estimation that is does not, does not require a specific you know, CAD model. Essentially, we can you know, just know that this is a laptop or this is a cup. It helps us to regress the 3D pose of the object. I will not go into too much detail here. It is an architecture based on Masker CNN. And in addition to the usual heads, we introduce this Knox map head and also depth that helps uh, regularize the size. One challenge here has been how to get uh, training data because uh, it's, uh, getting posed, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it's not so, it's not so, so easy. Here we scanned IKEA furniture settings and placed on them um, synthetic shaped net objects to create scenes where we could uh, we could train with. And in addition, we used a small a real world data set plus some Coco images without uh, annotation for pre-training the, uh, the master CNN network. And here are some examples of the results. For example, here you see the original scene. This is the Knox ground truth. This is the predicted Knox. And here you see the, the ground truth uh, bounding boxes and the predicted ones from us. The, uh, you know, our interest in this was to be able to easily aggregate uh, pictures from multiple views, because once you have this canonical embedding into 3D, then it is possible, of course, to just take the union of, of views coming from uh, multiple cameras. Uh, we extended this work to articulated objects, where the goal is to uh, uh, estimate not just uh, the pose of the object, but the pose of its part and the corresponding articulation uh, joints and the state of the joints. So here we have this normalized part coordinate space. So there's one space per part and one space for the whole object. And uh, you can see essentially how these canonicalizations go. You canonicalize the articulations, then you, you align the shapes, and then you center them and scale them. So all these things are meant to make the job of the network easier because they remove variability and they allow information 
aggregation. So, so again, here there are two points in the plus plus is one doing the regression for parts, one doing the regression for the whole thing and also the segmentation. And again, the estimation of the joints is greatly facilitated by the canonicalization provided by the network. These, these are some examples on our synthetic uh, scenes. The estimation we have of the joints is, is clearly superior to uh, doing it uh, by other methods like point net. Here are some, some real data. And uh, very recently we extended this to dynamic uh, scenes where essentially it's a, it's a, you know, the shape is moving or maybe the camera is moving. Uh, again, I will not go into too much detail here. I just want to mention that um, it's a combination of a, of a coordinate based approach for estimating scale and translation and a rotation estimation done separately, again, facilitated by the can canonicalization, uh, essentially combining classical sort of direct regression and, and uh, a coordinate estimation approaches. And you can see here some, some results on on synthetic data and some on real data. Okay, um, I'll, uh, the next thing I want to discuss uh, is uh, going even more in this in the temporal dimension. What I was showing here is kind of more classical tracking, but I'll be interested in discussing um, settings where you have data from multiple viewpoints and perhaps that are not uh, you know, continuously tracked. And of course, this has many applications in autonomous driving, robotics, and mixed reality. So again, the setting now is we're going to have uh, data coming over time, and we want to be able to both aggregate shape in a canonical way for reconstruction, that's what I was discussing up to now, but also understand the motion, get a continuous representation of the evolution of the, uh, of the scene. So there is this uh, spatial reconstruction part, but that allows us to aggregate multiple frames and compute shame. We want that to be, of course, generalizable to different instances and ultimately different classes, but also there is a canonicalization over time. So, so for this, so now we have what we call T-NOX, um, temporal NOX, and the corresponding T-point net plus plus <coughs> that aggregates information over space and time. It does it in a bit of a, <coughs> an orthodox way. Um, it, um, it processes each, each frame separately, especially only using point net plus plus. It processes all the frames together, X, Y, Z, and T, using a point net. So there's no communication among the points here. So this is different from, say, something like Minkowski net, because this treats time differently from these, these special dimensions. And it generates a latent fixture per point. Uh, what we want to do with these fixtures is given, say, data at some observed time steps, we would like to uh, estimate what was the motion in between and then be able to sample this trajectory and generate uh, what, would, what we would have seen at these intermediate steps, at the, at the unobserved steps. So this is uh, done through a dynamics network that operates directly in latent space. So basically here we're using a latent neural ODE that started from an initial state. Where we have a, this learned dynamics network that predicts what uh, the trajectory will be. Uh, and of course, we have to address the problem of going from this latent space back to the, uh, back to the original space. Uh, <clears throat> and for this, we use the, the technique proposed in point flow. In yeah, the point flow work, where essentially we have a canonical distribution like a Gaussian, and then we learn a continuous normalizing flow that 
maps a sampling of this Gaussian to a point cloud in, in 3D conditioned on the latent state at Ti. And uh, um, this mapping is one to one, so one can go from the point cloud to the underlying distribution, which of course is very nice because it gives a way to compute likelihoods of points. So the whole architecture of what we call Casper uh, is essentially an autoencoder with an OD bottleneck for the information aggregation. And uh, it has the, the reconstruction, uh, the chemicalization component, and that's one of the losses used. And then the latent representation has a static part, which essentially you can think of as sort of the shape of the car and the dynamic part, which is the motion, which is this latent one. OD that allows this 3D reconstruction. So now we can have also a loss based on the log likelihoods coming from the continuous normalizing flow. And so, you can see here, given these very sparse frames, we are able to aggregate them to do multi-view reconstruction. One can also use them to do old estimation. Um, one can take very sparse inputs, say three observed steps of 512 points, and use Casper to upsample both spatially and temporally, because once we have the Gaussian, we can sample it at any resolution. And of course, time we can sample at, at any resolution. So here we, you can see that, so, you know, you are seeing what the sensor would have seen canonicalized to be the same pose. And you can even visualize the contours of the Gaussian in this last animation. So it is nice that we get correspondences over space and time from these normalizing flows. This allows us to also deal with things like that are not physical here, um, say deformations of the input, but this will be the important thing what I will talk about next. The particular use of the correspondences is that we can say annotate a particular frame, pull the annotations back to the underlying Gaussian distribution, and then push them forward to other frames. So this is a way to transfer labels uh, from, from frame to frame. In other words, you know, to aggregate annotations from all frame, from some subset, of, some subset of the frames to all the frames. Um, everything that I showed so far has been on synthetic data. We have just started to play with more more real data coming from self-driving scenarios like 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 new scenes. Um, I'm running I'm running a little bit short of time. I think I'll go very quickly over this next part, which is really an extension of, of this idea to motions not of cars but of people. Um, again, by doing ODEs in latent spaces. Uh, what this tries to address is the issue that uh, when you try to track moving objects, uh, the quality can be bad when the object becomes you know, occluded. As the human is behind the chairs, the reconstruction is not so good. As you can see here, this is not a physical motion of the human. And, and what the method that I will very, very briefly describe can do is give you a more realistic motion because it has very good priors about human motion. So this is this humor work that's very new. And basically it learns a model, not of human poses, but of human pose transitions. And then at the test time, it uses that as a prior to regularize the, the motion reconstruction. And also it can take input in many different modalities. Um, I don't think I have time to really explain. As I said, this is a dynamics model learning post transitions, um, essentially a conditional VAE on, on that that allows you to roll out motions that have physical plausibility. And I just show some example reconstructions. Uh, this recovers not only the joint motions, but also the contacts, which of course really matter in understanding how people move. And uh, this compares to a number of uh, other systems. 
Here is another example where a lot of the contact area is not visible as a human sit down. And this is uh, what I was showing before uh, was only based on RGB data. This is uses RGBD, so it estimates the ground plane and how the human walks on the ground plane. I'm, all, I'm almost out of time. The very last thing that I wanted to show, again, I'll be, I'll be very brief, is that one can do joint learning and benefit by, by, imposing, by imposing consistency across different tasks. Um, so this is a, this is a work from uh, CPPR uh, last year, where the notion is if we have an image like the one I show here, and then we compute various derived attributes that themselves can be thought of as images, like surface normals, shading. This means what would the picture look like if there was a light at the camera, depth, curvature. Well, I mean, we, we do something, but you can see some of the detail of this Mukarna here is not captured that well. But of course, all these images, all these derived quantities have to be correlated because they all refer to the same underlying world. So the notion is that we can do better if we enforce consistency between them. So we want to go from X to, to you know, from input image X to modality Y1 to modality Y2, but then enforce consistency between them. And then by doing that, we can do, we can do better. Um, yeah, I think I'm out of time. So uh, I'll just, uh, so again, yeah, the, the idea is, is to enforce this consistency. Here we use the Toscronomy data set where we have 26 visual uh, tasks to, to process and looked at how we can gain by enforcing consistency among them. And I show here some examples where the top is with consistency, say estimating, shading, curvature, whatever, either directly or by first going through depth also and, and then forcing consistency between these. And I think in all cases, you can see that the consistency really adds to the quality that you get. Um, since I need to, this is, this is more examples of different consistency paths and how they improve upon not having consistency. Uh, I'm, yeah, sorry, I think I'm, I'm gonna have to skip what I had here so, I, so we can finish on time. Uh, the only thing that I want to mention is that uh, um, this can be applied to out of training domain data. Uh, here's, for, for, for example, applications to, I don't know, uh, you know, Evan Gogh painting. And again, you can do better, even though you are not trained on that data. And consistency can be thought of as, or, or maybe lack of consistency, as an indication that something may be going wrong. So as you do out of domain shifts, you can use this consistency energy to measure how much you should believe the quality of your, uh, of your networks. And so we, the last thing that I will show is this small example where we are working through one of these, um, I think, um, not I think these motherboard scenes. And uh, um, as we introduce artifacts into the image, like JPEG compression, then you will see this consistency loss or energy you go up, things become kind of more inconsistent. So this gives you a way to, to, to know as you are moving around and perhaps the world is changing, whether at some point you, you cannot trust your, your detectors now. Okay, I think I've, I've run out of time. So let me summarize. I talked about uh, joint learning. This is the notion that we can do better when we solve many learning problems and many learning tasks jointly as opposed to separately using the power of factorization, mechanicalization, information aggregation, and of joint optimization. And uh, uh, I'll end with one uh, quote. Uh, Heraclitus was a, a Greek philosopher yeah, before Socrates, um, wrote many aphorisms. Uh, the one that I like is this, that although the reason is common, many live as if they have a private understanding. I mean, this is, I guess, a big topic in the US these days because there are these multiple views of what happened in the last election. Uh, but I think it can also be applied very well to deepness and to say that, that currently 
uh, somehow our deepness have too many private understandings. They might do better if they communicate and they share information and knowledge so we can all arrive at a common understanding. And that was the main point I was trying to convey in this talk. So I'd like to end by thanking the people in my group for all their work. And I think everything that, that I showed was who worked by yeah, primarily by them, also my senior collaborators who helped in many of these projects, and also my funding agencies and companies. And uh, thank you, and stop and take questions. Fantastic. Um, thanks a lot for the amazing talk. I mean, of course, there's, there's probably many, many questions. Um, so we can take a few questions via Zoom. Um, so if anybody has a question, you can just unmute yourself and please also turn on your video. Um, maybe I can start with one question. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I like the vector neuron work. It's really cool. I mean, that, that I think is really amazing. It was the big, the big paper in the last week or so that came up, I think, in archive. At least that's when I, when I saw it. Um, so what's your high level, like, what's your thought process, right? I mean, there's two ideas, right? Like, one of them is we're going to go ahead and just throw in more data for augmentations. Um, and the other option is, well, how much do we need to do in terms of finding better operators in the networks itself to be to, to realize these invariances and so on, right? So are we right now stuck in the local minima where you think, oh, like convolutions and so on, they fall in the first category and like, okay, with augmentations, we're only gonna go that far and we just should just abandon it and just move on and do something completely different? Or do you think there's still kind of a, a way to salvage the existing frameworks where we can go further? Um, yeah, that's a very good question, Matthias. And I'm not sure I, yeah, I know which way to go. I think it's, it, I mean, people ask this question now about, you know, is, are, are transformers the replacement for everything? You know, does the one need convolutions anymore or will transformers eventually uh, kind of do everything? Uh, I mean, it seems to me ultimately what these things depend on is how the communication pattern that you establish is appropriate for the task that you have. That is one aspect. The issue I was trying to address is more of the data format aspect and trying to say if you can sort of remove or factorize out certain kind of variability in your data, then you make the aggregation task easier because you don't have to worry about this kind of variability. Um, I mean, there's a lot of different constructions for equivariance, and I think this topic is, um, is still open for for further work. Um, and in fact, you know, depending on the application, you may want to say allow equivariance to only certain transformations and not others. Uh, for example, the net, what I showed is also uh, equivariant to reflections, but actually this may be bad because say, say for camera, you pose estimation when you have symmetric objects, this can give you ambiguities. So, so you may want to have a formulation that allows you to be rotation equivariant, but, uh, but not uh, a reflection equivariant. I think there's many subtle issues that still need to be addressed. Yeah, cool. Any other questions? Um, maybe more specifically along these lines, in terms of the rotation equivariant uh, operators, I think you were showing some shape reconstruction results in comparison to the occupancy right. networks. Are, are these shapes being reconstructed in a canonical space, or is there a way to actually back out the original rotation? Um, ideally, for, for a generative scenario, you'd also like to be able to infer the, the rotation itself. Um, maybe I didn't un understand the question. Uh, the, the, the reconstruction that, I, that we're showing, the, um, the input is in any orientation. Mm -hmm. But the, the output, is that in a canonical orientation? Are you, or are you, um, the, because the uh, rotation invariant operators seem to imply that you would the construct. Work that, yeah, the other work that I showed has an invariant decoder. That means it is constructed a canonical mm -hmm. orient. But you are saying that it would also be useful to be able to actually reconstruct in the original 
Yeah, that would be also pretty cool. Yeah. Since yeah. also I think you you're learning certain orientations, maybe it would be possible to learn the the orientation of the object and apply it back to the canonical space. Right. I mean, I think one can 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 combine the two. One can estimate the the rotation from the canonical pose together with the reconstruction, and then one can sort of undo the canonicalization in the reconstruction. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, no, I was sorry. Um, just wondering because I thought it would be cool to be able to apply to kind of scene scenarios. But here, here it might be more important to maintain the original um, rotation or orientation of, of the objects that are being seen. I mean, clearly, canonicalization helps learning. So perhaps, so, I mean, you know, I think that, that an invariant decoder is easier to train than an equivariant decoder. But again, maybe one can factorize these two things and kind of learn them separately and then uh, essentially get the effect of an equivariant decoder. Yeah, uh, yeah. that makes sense. In, Any I think other in general, you know, we are asking, I mean, is there an invariant name for a point of a shape so that no matter how, you know, no matter what orientation I give you the shape, if I give you the name of the point, you can tell me which point this is. Uh, you know, if I, can, if, I can, if I can canonicalize the shape, then of course the coordinates of that point become its name. But is it possible to do that without actually uh, kind of requiring a, a canonical pose for the shape. No, I mean, I think that the canonicalization is is important and it also intuitively seems like a, a good idea in yeah. the sense of, of probably how people are imagining objects in a, in a canonical pose as opposed to um, attached to actually to their orientations. But of yeah. course, um, sorry. I mean, that was the Nox idea that somehow by imagining the object in a canonical pose, in a canonical space, you make the reconstruction those easier because the network always aims for this canonical pose and doesn't have to worry about how the object sits in the real world. Mm -hmm. Any more comments or questions? Yeah, anyone from the students, don't be shy. It's always the challenging thing why I assume calls. Hey, Leo. Hey, um, hey. See you again. <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah. Um, I have a question regarding the normalizing flows. Like, I tried to have a look at them um, and try to understand them because I think it's like really, really cool to be able to uh, go in both directions, like back and forth, and have like this uh, bi directional mapping, right? Right. Um, like, what's the missing point here right now? Um, like, they're still missing, like, in the 2D domain, for example, to reach the levels of, I don't know, style again or uh, VAEs. Yeah, I mean, the, the as, you know, as you saw in those uh, slides, the, the reconstruction quality is really quite uh, coarse. And, uh, uh, it definitely seems that some detail is lost in this mapping. Um, I, I think there's a number of ideas that we have on how to, to improve on that by, uh, I mean, uh, you know, one way to, to think about this is kind of a parameterization, right? It's, uh, uh, you know, the underlying space is the Gaussian and then you have this parametric map given a point of the Gaussian, how to generate the point in, in three space. Um, and, uh, and so perhaps one can think of a composition of parametric maps where there are more local maps that then take care of the detail in each part of the space. I mean, they've been worked like that in the implicit world, right? Where you have local implicits, like uh, uh, you know, Carl Genova, mm -hmm. Stephen Tom Funkhauser had this work where you essentially express a shape as a bunch of, I don't know, kind of Gaussians or metaballs, and then you put 
structure on top of that through local implicit. And I think perhaps something like this can be done here too. Um, I mean, like for GANs, you also start with like a certain distribution. Um, so here, like GANs, for example, seem to be able to capture still these details, but don't have the backward projection. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is the issue because you want to maintain the the one on one. It's also the at, at, at this new work from Nespina Pascalidou at MPI, she, she has what she calls the neural parts. But the idea is you learn a, a homeomorphism between a ball and a part. And again, these are not extremely detailed parts, but, but this one to one. And uh, yeah, I. I don't know, I mean, offhand, I, I don't see why you couldn't have a gun that operates at the level of, of these mappings, right? As opposed to reconstructing the... Uh, I mean, you know, we, we, we tend to think of uh, networks at every layer you map to, to a new space, yes? You, you go from, I don't know, if you, if you think about the regular, you know, the sort of you know, discussion of a CNN, you go from low level fixtures, you know, edges to intermediate fixtures to high level fixtures. But a lot of things can happen also when you stay in the same space. I and mean, biology is a good example. You know, we all grow from the same embryo and get very detailed structure while staying in the same free space. So I don't see why one cannot have some formulation directly in free space that is detailed, you know. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thanks. Cool, thanks a lot. So we are a little bit out of time and I don't want to stress it too much. So first of all, I would like to thank everybody on, on YouTube. Um, so we'll see you next week again with another lecture and otherwise I will end the stream for the time being. Okay, thanks everybody for, for listening. Um, do you still